welcome to Films and Stuff with your hosts, Pete Mitchell and Ethan Hunt. Pete, Films and Stuff, it's time for my favorite one hour of the entire week. Although I have a, I have a gut feeling that we may go a little bit long today. We've got a lot to discuss. That's right. We've got a very exciting episode of House of the Dragons, and we've oh, got yeah. the season finale of Rings of Power. Where do you want to start? Let's do what we normally do. Let's do House of the Dragon only because Rings of Power, it's fitting. It's got the finale. We can talk about it at the end and cap off the episode with it. Fair enough. Okay. What did you think? Let's talk, uh, let's talk macro view. Macro view, I thought it was a very good episode to make. I mean, basically, Viserys has passed away, and the the ongoing deterioration of his health was a major storyline, and really, it was just a bunch of like batting practice until he finally passes away. And now that he's passed away, the real fight is on, right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And, you know, we joked about it back in episode one and two, but I have to say they kind of handle his deterioration quite masterfully. I agree. I agree. With that last reveal of Mm -hmm. his face on, you know, at the dinner table with the, at the family dinner, let's put it that way. Yeah. That was quite uh, shocking. I mean, not in a grotesque way, but just shocking as to, how much he's fallen, let's put it that way. Harvey Dent. Yeah, I mean, he, 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 and you have to give him a lot of credit. He goes out in a very dignified blaze of glory, right? Yeah, You see absolutely. a very heartwarming scene where he pulls himself out of bed, barely makes it to the throne, but he's, you know, determined to do so. Even a nice little scene with his uh, brother Damon helping him to the throne and picking up his crown when it falls off. A quick caveat, that was actually improvised, that scene. Oh, really? Yeah. That sequence where he drops the crown, the crown falls from his head, and Damon gingerly puts it back on his head, like, you know, as a, a brotherly sign of affection. 100% improvised by Matt, wow. da- uh, Matt Smith. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Great. Great stuff. Good insight. So I thought I thought his, his demise was great. He has that... You know, blaze of glory. He's got the family dinner where obviously he knows that he's going to be passing soon, if not that evening. And he basically says, look, I love you all. Stop fighting. Let's just have one really nice dinner together. Alicent, Renera, pull it together. Give each other some compliments. Then it's time for him to go to bed. And of course, then the gloves come off and all hell breaks loose, right? Yeah, but what I liked about this episode is that it also even the playing field. I think that if you had to look at Did Alicent's... It? Yeah, a little bit. Really? I'll tell you why. Tell me if why. If you look at Alicent's <laughs> children, yeah. as much as you hate Egon, because he's now, you know, a philandering womanizer who's, you know, basically a lout. He's the worst. He is. But his younger brother is like a mini... Damon. A Damon. Right? Yeah. He's cruel. He's a yeah. very adept fighter. Very whereas, confident. Very confident. Right? Whereas, if you look at Rhaenyra's first two kids, yeah, the they whips. are not. They are absolutely not. They seem to be more adept as politicians than they would be as fighters. Yeah. So, if you had to fight, I would say that Allison's kids would definitely win out. Now, though, there was that one sequence where Damon at the throne room cuts off Corliss's brother's head. And there was a, I don't know if you noticed this, but there was a quick cutaway in that sequence immediately after the head comes off. The camera goes straight to Eamon's face or Eamon's face. And you Mm -hmm. can see he raises an eyebrow, right? Because we saw Eamon earlier in that episode training with Cole and then defeating Kristen Cole. And Christian yeah. Cole was very proud of him for that. So that yeah. was setting him up to be like, hey, I'm the guy who's going to take down anybody who comes up against me. Mm. And then all of a sudden you had Damon kind of put an exclamation point and reminder that, hey, I'm still the alpha when it comes to fighting here. 
I just cut off this guy's head in the throne room, which is a big no-no for everyone. Can I make an observation about that scene? I really felt that, I mean, I like Corliss, the sea snake, and I kind of liked his brother, Vaymond, and I have to say I agree with Vaymond's position, but I thought that there was a missed opportunity that the way that he spoke was way too aggressive at the end. He had to know that that was going to be ending badly. He had no one on his side, no one supporting him. I felt like that was so stupid. It would have been better if he would have, I felt for the story, if instead of just basically committing suicide, he would have stormed out and basically kept control of the fleet and said, you know what? Come take the fleet from me. It's, It's my brother's fleet. It's my fleet. All the men are loyal to me. I control the ships. You want, uh, what's the little dude's name? Laris to take over? Come take it from me. You made your ruling. I hear it. I'm not going to follow it. You want me to follow it? Come take the fleet from me. Impossible. That would have been, for me, a way better storyline than just letting him die. On a story or let's say a practical basis, I'm with you. Yeah. I think that's absolutely the right ma- play to make. If this were the real world and if we were in that position, I think that would be the more savvy maneuver to do. Yes. But in terms of a practical or maybe, you know, an HBO way of thinking about it, this also allows Arenas, by series' yeah. sister, to then become a major player because she wasn't allowed to be queen. And so yeah. now she basically, she becomes the queen's hand, right? Or the king's hand. Driftwood goes to the kid and she gets to basically say, hey, I'm going to run Driftwood now. In terms of story. I guess. You know, you, but again, I'm 100% with you. I fully agree that tactically speaking, that was guaranteed suicide. So so I, I kind of saw this. You made a good point. Now I'm going to walk through it. I saw this episode as... Now that Viserys is gone, it's clearly Rhaenyra and Alicent's sides opposed to each other. And Rhaenyra's side is way more fortified with the marriage of her kids to Damon's kids, right? Yep. Okay. Well, no, no, no. Remember he pledges, she pledges one of her kids to uh, Damon's kids. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. you're right. You're absolutely I know, it's, right. it right. sounds weird because basically Damon's kids are marrying Damon's kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's complicated in that Targaryen family, yeah? So I saw this very funny meme that, <laughs> that said, like, if you don't stop, my uncle's going to come for my brother and my cousin and my blah, blah, blah. And it basically is the same person. In every right, picture. right. Okay. But what I don't understand is where is Corliss's wife, right? Viserys' sister. Yep. Where is she going to fall in this? She's going to be like a third pillar and be fighting for herself. If so, who's on her side? She doesn't have any allies. But I think that's what she recognized, which is why she finally... So she was opposed to the marriage at first, right? Because she, she rebuffed Rhaenyra yeah. in the garden earlier. But I think she realized in that throne room that if she wants to make it out of here with not just her head, but also with her family in the throne or on the throne or not even on the throne. I think she's more concerned about Driftmark and that's it. I don't think Mm. she really gives a damn about King's Landing. I think she really only cares for Driftmark. Yeah. I think this is the way that she gets to get that done. Yeah, Maybe. I mean, it, it it would be fun if it was like a three-way, right? Three-way is always fun. But it would be more fun if it was, <laughs> if there was like a third person making a claim to the throne and if she had someone supporting her, right? And she could have done that if she would have supported Vaymond. She could have said, fine, you take, you take, you know, the uh, high tides and you support me as, you know, taking over for Fuseris, right? And then she's got the the fleet behind her. So I feel like, what did she do? She just married off her two granddaughters. She's she's really behind. If all she wants is that, that driftwood throne and high tides, okay, I mean, I guess she can still live in the house, but I feel like she's ceded all her power where there is a much better play for her to be, to make. Maybe, but I'm not sure. And and for for sure, her story yeah. isn't over. I agree. 
But where I does think this she's going to be a bit yeah. like Natalie Dormer's grandmother. Yeah. The Tyrells. I think she's going to be pulling a lot of the strings behind the scenes. Maybe. I mean, I hope so. Because I think right now, you saw that this was very balanced. I felt strongly the opposite. I feel like mm. everything is on Rhaenyra's side. She's she's appointed as the new queen, so to speak. Her husband is very, very strong and supportive. She's got, you know, now the, the three kids... And she's got now the the two other kids, right, which are Valerians. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like everything is on her side. Alicent is going to be pushed out. And she has, to be honest, only one kid who's Amond, who has a dragon, who's really kind of the only threat. Yeah, but I think that's what's going to make her a cornered animal. So I think she's going yeah. to start. And, you know, we saw that bits of that animalistic streak yeah. in her when she cut Rhaenyra yeah. earlier. I think we're going to see a lot more of her. I think this is when she goes back to Larry Strong. And I think she starts an undermining campaign to commit, you know, not commit, like commit assassinations. I kind of thought one of the things I think that this may be set up for, because you heard that Rhaenyra said it to Damon when she walked into, I guess, King's Landing Castle, the Red Keep. She's like, hey, I don't even recognize the place. And that's because... Apparently, all of the Alicent, religious figures, yeah, yes. So, I mean, maybe Alicent is going to turn to the seven gods. Is that what they're called? Right? I'm not sure. Yeah, but the seven, right? Uh, turn to the seven and and have them make a declaration that hey, like due to the fact that these are not her kids, they cannot be next in line to the throne, and maybe she starts to put some pressure on through you know through the seven. Maybe, but now that she's also got kids with Damon, that kind of, that leverage goes away. Because even if that's the case, and even if she, even if the first two boys lose their position in line, she's still got the, the young. Yeah. She's got one in the oven and she's already got one kid with Damon. Yeah. So, so actually that's, I think I mentioned this last episode. So yeah, bring the, you called bring the it. You one hundred percent called it. Th- this is where I feel like maybe the real Game of Thrones isn't between Alicent and Rhaenyra anymore. Maybe that's over, and we thought that was the the battle du jour, and it's not. Maybe it's now between Rhaenyra's kids, right? We've got the two Valerian kids saying, "Hey, wait a second, we're older, and we're more qualified," and the Damon Rhaenyra kids are like, "Wait, we're a hundred percent qualified." And now it's a it's a grandchildren battle, right? Yeah, yeah, and and I think you're right because a we you know we've been talking about how do we extend this beyond one season? This yeah. is the perfect way to do it. Yes, because now you have a group of young actors who will yes. grow into the roles. And b I read that George R. R. Martin says that there needs to be four seasons of ten episodes each to tell this complete story. Which is aligned with what we were talking about, right? When yeah. we said, how many seasons is this thing going to be? Yeah. This is exactly right. So we yeah. assumed that there were going to be at least five, if not more. Whereas yeah. he went out and said, hey, look, there's going to be at least four yeah. seasons of 10 each. I, I feel like Amond is going to continue to be a force to be reckoned with. Um, I feel like Aegon is nothing. I'm still not sure where that sister falls into things. But yeah, maybe this is going down a generation, and and that's where the real battle is. Although that means that the, that means that there's a lot of time jumps, and time jumps are really tough. Man, it's uh, I, we talked about we alluded to this in our last episode, but yeah. I'm kind of tired of time jumps mid season. I can kind of understand a time jump between season one and two, or between two and three, or whatever. I can yeah. kind of get that. There have been four time jumps in this season alone of 12 episodes. That's a lot. Yeah. I'm not saying that you're losing out on story because we're still seeing a very good story play yeah. out. But I don't know. I feel like you're not giving the actors a chance to really spread their wings either. Yeah. I mean, I I agree on that. It's. I mean, I don't know how many more time jumps we can really have. I mean, Matt Smith has stayed the same in every episode, right? We've changed Rhaenyra. We've changed a little bit Alicent. of hairstyle difference here and there, yeah. but that's it. Yeah. I mean, Aegon, 
somehow got or Eamon somehow got huge. Right? Not just huge. I feel like he's like a thirty year old man now. Yeah. I mean he went from twelve to thirty in, in one episode, but yeah, I, I feel the same way that the time jumps are necessary. Otherwise, the story is just going to be too static. You know, there's only so much drama you can have in the same year. But at the same time, that jumping really hurts character continuity. Yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to see. And also, you know, you brought this up a couple episodes ago when we were changing from Millie Alcock to Emma Darcy, right? Yeah. It's kind of a shame to only be this character yeah. for three episodes or six episodes or one episode or two episodes. Comic-Con just like, is going to be so complicated. Not just that, but you're <laughs> just like, oh my God, this, I'm an actor. I'm a young actor. This is my big break. Can you believe it? I've been cast on Game of Thrones' yeah. prequel on HBO Max yeah. for episodes. one episode as this yeah. young kid. You know what yeah. I mean? It's a bit, yeah. oh, it's a bit of a kick I in know. the teeth. I agree. Any work is good work, don't get me wrong, but at the same time you're just like, "Oh, son of a bitch," right? You feel like uh yeah. it's a it's a wasted opportunity almost. Yeah. So there there's one thing that happened and I I want to get your opinion on what it means. You saw like after this family dinner that ended in uh fisticuffs that Allison or went almost, back. Yeah. yeah. And and Allison, you know, as Renera mentioned, she's been very very good to Viserys. She goes back and she's taking care of him, blah, blah, blah. Viserys is out of his mind. He doesn't know who he's talking to. And he starts talking about basically the White Walkers. Winter is coming. Of Thrones, right? Yeah. Think it, thinking that he's talking to Rhaenyra, right? Yeah. What does this mean? And I hadn't thought of this until you mentioned this. I think Allison takes this opportunity, or maybe not this opportunity, but sees this as the prophecy that she finally learns about, right? Because remember, that's the same knife, by the way, that she also used to cut uh, Rhaenyra with. Yep, yep. So I think she's going to kind of use this as a way to introduce the religious zealotry aspect of her character into the show. To be determined, but that's what I feel. Who do you like the most on the show? Who's the character that like now is like really like fascinating you? Like Who are you cheering for? Ah, it's tough to really say, man. Honestly, it sounds really bad. Damon. Uh, I have to say, I I feel like I like Alicent a lot. Maybe more as a character than as a person. I feel like I'm probably a little bit more aligned to Rhaenyra as a person. But Rhaenyra was just so... She had so many episodes slash years where she just wasn't acting kind of like queen-like, that that really turned me off. You right. Know? I don't like Aegon at all. I mean, Helena is is unknown and weird. Aemond, of course, is is just a jerk, but he's kind of a compelling character because he's a young Matt Smith, right? He's, he's yeah, exactly. Daemon. He's a young Damon, exactly. Yeah. So if you if you like Damon, in, in a way, you need to like Aemond a little bit, you know. I do on the for yeah. exactly the same reasons, which is to say that he is yeah. a a physically strong character, yeah. and b I think a lot of the let's say the more exciting parts of the show are going to fall mm -hmm. on his shoulders. Yeah. Whereas I think Jaceres and Luceres are very nice young men, exactly the type of of boys you'd want to raise. But as you mentioned, I mean, they're way better than Aegon, but compared to Aemond, they're really kind of weak, you know? So I think that's that's going to be interesting. And then, of course, they're going to be marrying, you know, the the Valerian daughters. So at least that consolidates things, but I'm I'm really interested to see how that kind of schemes out, right? Because I think even within that family, there's going to be a whole lot of, I don't know, not viciousness, but... Not everyone is going to be aligned, right? So if you've got, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot here, but based on the first 10 episodes, sorry, first mm. eight episodes that we've seen, and we've only got two really, ep two episodes left in this season for mm. House of the Dragon. So based on mm. what we've seen so far, and now really, I think at this point, we're not getting introduced to any more new characters within the family. I think, I think the family right. lineages yeah. are more or less set on Allison's yeah. side and on Rhaenyra's side. Who do you think comes out on top 
And by the top, I mean, yeah. obviously, we know that neither side really wins yeah. based on Game of Thrones season one. But in terms yeah. of where we're standing today, who do you think lives to tell the tale? Or more importantly, who do you think is going to be the great, great grandparents of Daenerys Targaryen? So I, I kind of feel like it's going to it's gonna go like this. Alicent, it's going to be like kind of like one of these White House transitions. Alicent is going to stay as long as she can and somehow stretch this out through some type of like procedure, protocol, or just refusal to, to move out of the house, you know? She'll, she's going to be a bad tenant. And Rhaenyra is going to deal with that for a while. And then I imagine Alicent's just going to be killed. I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing. And then Rhaenyra and Damon and everyone will take over. Uh, Aegon is just going to be happy drinking and whoring his way through life. Aemond is going to be like, I'm taking down that family. Aemond is going to be the guy that takes down that family. He may never, but he's going to be, I think, the guy who passes down this rage and this feeling that I should have been king. It should have been my family. And then I think in, in future seasons, Aemond is always going to be kind of like a thorn in the side. But I also see that there's going to be some split between Damon and Rhaenyra. And the only reason I guess that is because Damon's never, ever been a good number two. He's always been restless. He's always been aggressive. He's always wanted his way. I, I just don't see him being like the house husband type that sits back. I feel like he's going to get involved. He's going to meddle. He's going to be like, yeah, but I should be doing this. Or yes, I can do this. And he's not going to listen. He's not going to ask her advice. He's just going to be off in the stepping stones fighting wars or this place and fighting wars. He's just going to kind of do whatever he wants to do. And I feel like there's going to be constant tension between Rhaenyra, the queen who should be giving orders, and Damon, who also has the same lineage, who's basically doing things on his own. And I think that's what's going to kind of like divide the family. Okay. So you think it's going to end up being Aemon on the throne? No, I don't think Aemon will ever get on the throne. I think Aemon is a guy who's always going to pass down this, I guess, like f feeling that he was inappropriately passed over, right? Aegon is nothing. Aegon's not going to do anything, but Aemon is a guy who's going to pass it all the way down to Daenerys, right? And, and be like, I think all that rage is going to come from Aemon his dragon, his dragon eggs from his dragon and so forth, all that will be passed down all the way to so Daenerys. I think what's going to happen is that Aemon is going to get taken out first. Oh, really? Yeah, here's my hot take. I think the way it stands now, That's I think way. he's going to play his, he's going to overplay a hand That's because right. he's super confident, <laughs> he's super cocky, he's super aggressive. Yeah. I think he's going to overplay his hand. I think he's going to take out one of the two bastard children. Mm. I think whoever he takes out, it's going to cause, or he's going to accidentally take out Damon and Rhaenyra as one of their two kids. So it's going to be Targaryen on Targaryen. I think there's going to be an overreaction or an overcorrection, in which case either Rhaenys gets involved because now she's atta they've attacked Corliss's line. But I think then what happens is that Damon and Egon, uh, not a uh, Egon, Aemond duke it out, or maybe not even Damon, maybe someone else. They duke it out. Aemond, I think, gets taken out. And I think what happens with that is that is the inciting event that makes Egon turn his life around to stop oh. being such a philandering Whoa. jerk. Whoa. And I when love that, this theory. I and, love this theory. It's and so that's when Egon kind of steps up and is like, listen, I am the true heir. And he absolutely dominates the battlefield. And I think that because you get a redemption arc and you know, one of the things we've both agreed on is that it's really hard to find someone that you really like on either side of the field. I think he's going to get a redemption arc. I think he's going to land a lot of people behind him. And I think he, because if what happened in Game of Thrones is correct, we're also going to learn that Egon's dragon is going to kill Rhaenyra, right? So I think that's going to happen 
through his redemption arc. There's also another thing that makes good sense, actually, because if you're looking at the House Targaryen, the Targaryens are pure Targaryens, right? Yes. So Aemon doesn't have a wife, and I don't think there's any one that he can marry, right? So the the kids, the lineage has to come from Aegon Helena. Yeah, or what they do in that is they they tr- try to broker p- peace. They say, "All right, Aemon, why don't you marry Rhaenyra and Daemon's natural born kid?" Did they mention if she was a girl or a boy, the first kid? I think it's a boy. I think it's yeah, a boy. Yeah, but we don't know what the... Because she's pregnant with Damon's second kid now, right? Yeah. So we don't so know. Rhaeny- Look at Rhaenyra having four boys, huh? Yeah, that's the other thing is... By the way, like... I mean, this is going to sound very crass, but they have so many kids between Alicent and between Rhaenyra that I was just like, you can kind of marry them off into every kingdom at this stage, right? I mean, I, I didn't feel like the survival rate was that high for babies. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's just a numbers game for them. I mean, we'll see. But I think that at this stage, and I can't stand him right now, but I think Egon is the one that comes through because he's the one who ultimately, or theoretically, his dragon is the one that kills Rhaenyra. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. That's where I'm standing today. I don't know. And obviously, this is going to change episode to episode and season to season. But I, you know, mark it, 15th of October... That's the the prediction that Pete's making on films and stuff. I'm going to start start a very slow transition to Rings of Power. Yeah, let's do it. By, by, by saying, House of the Dragon is so good because there's so much drama within very limited events. You know, if, if you really wanted to take a very high-level summary of this episode... A king was ill and was about to die. He called all his family to dinner. The family argued. He passed away. The end. Did anything more happen in the episode? No. Not really, no. (laughs) I mean, but yet we have just discussed this for over half an hour. And we could probably go on because there's a lot of... Nuance to all of it. There's a lot of nuance to all of this, right? Now, and as much as I've loved House of the Dragon, and I can't wait until the next episode in two days, I get to Rings of Power. Pete, how do you feel? Uh, I feel disappointed, I have to say. (laughs) I have to say. And no. Amazon, are you listening? Come on. Throw us something. So. As you know, and as most of our listeners know by now, I take copious notes when I watch when I watch copious. flagship programs, right? Copious. So, with Rings of Power, with House of the Dragon, I make sure that I have my notepad on my computer open, and I'm able to pause for a second and immediately take down notes of what I saw or what I think is an important take or not. And that's yeah. why I'm able to remember accurately small nuances like the that the like the quick camera uh, smash to Eamon's face when you see Damon decapitate bravo Damon. my friend bravo small to you and your notepad small things that where you're just like okay maybe it means nothing but maybe it means everything we'll see how that comes mm-hmm. out i'm finding with every episode i'm taking fewer and fewer and fewer <laughs> lines of notes with rings of power to the point where in episode 8 the finale of the first season of rings of power and mind you this season cost 715 million dollars to make how many credits is that in in empirical credits? Yeah, exactly. Right, eighty million. Eighty That's million 80 credits. Million. That is one quadrant <laughs> salary in the galaxy. So it oh, man, was no. unbelievable that I had one note. I had one line of notes. That's it. And what's your note? Tell me what the note is. Where the hell? I what? Where the hell are the dwarves? That's it. That was the only note. That was the only note. After what we saw in episode seven, why wouldn't you show us what we see in episode uh, with happened in uh, uh, the mines? What nonsense! 
I don't need to oh, know about the Balrog. Man. Fine. I don't need to know exactly what's going on with the Balrog. As we predicted correctly last week, it was a tease for future epi- uh, seasons. Fine. But what happened to Durin, that's important. He was stripped of his title. What's he doing now? Where are things going to stand in the kingdom? Who's going to be next in line? Hi, are you telling me you're not going to tell us this for another eight, nine months now? Like that's going to—that's not even a reasonable cliffhanger. Pete, they—they they cannot do so because they are so busy shoving the Harfoots in my face. Yeah. That, that there is no screen time for yeah, anything. And meaningful. I remember I warned you two episodes ago. I said, listen, we got no Harfoots for four episodes or three episodes in a row. That means we're going to get Harfoot heavy at the end. And we did get Harfoot heavy at the end. I mean, it was total nonsense. It was really total nonsense. The Harfoots for me are the least valuable players in this franchise. And I think they're taking up the most amount of screen time for the least amount of impact on story. Oh, zero impact. So zero impact. The the stranger not being revealed, but kind of being teased, also not fun. I know. I'm pretty sure I know who it is. But if I had to ask you, I don't think you'd be able to tell me who, with confidence, who it is. Well, the the stranger is uh the wizard, right? Yeah, but which one? There's five. Gandalf. Is it Gandalf? It is Gandalf. Oh, I think it's Gandalf. I agree. But would you, as someone who hasn't watched Lord of the Rings, be able to tell me why you think it's Gandalf? Nope. I'd only say it's Gandalf because Gandalf is the only wizard I know. And I I mean, I'm just annoyed by, by Rings of Power. And it's it's really disappointing to me because I'm watching it and I'm just... I'm just like on a like a Ferris wheel. I'm just along for the ride, enjoying the view, whatever direction it points me at. I'll look at it. Yeah, you're but right. I'm, it's, I'm re- it's a very stale cookie. It's not, I, I'm not doing anything. I'm, there's I'm, it's boring. There's no climax. I'm not nervous about anything. Everything is then. It's intended to like tease me, like oh, this is this. No, it's not. Oh, maybe it's this. No, it's not. And then I felt like towards the end, it was like so rushed. It was like reveal, 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 reveal. Like the finale of like fireworks and like everything was going off at once. I was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, where were you for the first seven episodes where I just wanted like a bite of the cookie? And now you're just like, I'm choking on all these reveals at the same time. Like what's happening? I I was really, well. So... As someone who's watched Lord of the Rings and knows a little bit of the lore, and again, I am not, in by any means am I an expert, but I know a little bit of the lore. One, the educated guess is the stranger is Gandalf. He's one of the Astari, one of the Meyer, one of the, the wizards that come in, okay? He, in the lore, isn't supposed to come to Middle Earth for a few thousand more years. So the fact that he's here now it's a bit surprising, and that's why I thought it wasn't going to be Gandalf. But mm. that last line he has is, when uh, when in doubt, always follow your nose. That's something he says in the Lord of the Rings yeah. movies. That's what Gandalf yeah. uses as a line. And I was like, oh, yeah. maybe that is Gandalf. And that kind of explains why he's so close to the hobbits in general. They saved his ass. And I was like, oh, okay. That but doesn't make sense. So- it does, so at the beginning, there's these three witches, scary, right? sexy. Yeah. Let's call them scary, sexy ladies, right? They come and they say, "Oh, Lord Sauron," right? Yeah. And I was like, first of all, I was like, I can't believe we all knew it was Sauron, and now they're just like say it like so bluntly like that. But then they like pull the rug out of the carpet. Because the Harfoots are like, no, you're not bad. You can be good. You're good. He's like, yeah, I'm good, actually. And then you find it's just a trick, right? Yep. And that they were just trying to, like, confuse the dude and make him believe he was bad. No, no. Well, no, no. So I think they actually believed he was Sauron. And what they didn't realize is that it was actually Gandalf or one of – so they said it's one of the others, right? There are five wizards that come onto Middle Earth, Saruman, Gandalf, Radagast, and I can't remember the other two blue wizards, whatever they're called. 
So they were they were under the impression that this guy who came in the comet or, or came in the meteor was Sauron. That's what they believed. Why? They didn't. They immediately realized, oh my god, he's actually a good guy when he's able to in, unleash his inner goodness and destroy them. And you see kind of like this butterfly effect, and you see a little bit of. I don't know. It harkened back to the the ring wraiths and the Nazgul when they get destroyed. Some of the visual effects did. Can so, I just can I just make a practice point? Yeah. In life, if you're going to worship something, should you not be like really certain? Certain what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean that's true in like almost any cult, Middle Earth, almost anything. You should probably be pretty sure about what you're going to worship before you start worshiping it. Right? And I think also if you're so OP that you can you know put your hand in fire and burn things away, blah blah blah. How are you not able to take out four Harfoots? Oh, I agree. I mean, I mean that is the most one-sided match ever. I, I know that should have been. Uh, I snap my fingers; all four of them drop dead. I mean, I saw this coming though, right? It's it's of the course. typical bad guy pointing the gun and having this big long diatribe speech. I'm going to count to three. And if they just would have like taken the shot, it would all be over. Yeah. But instead, they had to pontificate for five minutes. And then, of course, they get taken out, right? Yeah. Blah. Of course. Anyway, what I figured, what I liked, though, this episode was, I will say, the Sauron reveal, the actual Sauron reveal. Yeah. I saw it coming, but not until maybe 10 or 15 minutes into this episode. Yeah. So I did like that. I have to admit that that to me was good because I didn't know who Halbrand was in terms of the lore. Yeah. You Never called it me. out from just to just to give Pete immense props for this. You said, and I think these are almost your words exactly, I don't trust someone who's so handsome. <laughs> you said it right. You said it. You're like you're like there's got to be something wrong with this guy. He can't be a good guy. I don't trust him. Well, good thank advice, you for that, ladies, lady listeners. Good that's advice. Right. <laughs> so I didn't remember. I mean, obviously, I didn't know. I don't know much of the lore of the Second Age yeah. at all. Yeah. But I do remember that Celebrimbor forged the rings with Sauron's help. When you see that Celebrimbor kind of takes to the Halbrand and that he's also a smith, I was just like, oh. That's going to be the twist. That's going to be the reveal of the episode. Uh, for me, that was not a surprise. And of course, by the way, I'm a little late, but spoiler alert. Hal Brown is sorry. <laughs> so that was... Hold on. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Did Hal Brown know all the way back when he was like on this little raft Definitely. that he was Sauron? Yes. So he was saying like, hey, I was just happy to be like a quiet dude living... Yeah, like typical an anonymous evil. Life. Uh, yeah, yeah, good evil. I mean, really a good evil reveal that way was that he's been a bad guy. He's been subtly manipulating everyone to do the things that he really wants them to do, which is a hallmark of Sauron, right? Like the guy is a master yeah. ma manipulator. So this is Galadriel's fault. I mean, kind of. Kind of kind of in the sense that would the same outcome have happened if she didn't have to like meddle in everything? Well, that's a question. That's questionable. I mean, it is what it is. That is the story. But yes. Yeah. This, I mean, if you look at it that way, she's the one who's been goading him on from the first place. Yeah. She's also been the one who was convinced that this guy was the lost king. And it wasn't until she gets back to the elven yeah. archives that she learns that there was no onward lineage. So he couldn't be the lost king. And then she puts two and two together. So she kind of mucked it all up. Though. She kind of mucked it all up because she put her face. She she went all in on this guy being somebody else. I mean, she was right about Sauron still being alive, but she yep. was right. Yep. But she essentially got herself manipulated by her over eagerness. Yes, her overzealousness is what really right? did her, and her inability to separate the wood from the trees. She just wanted to like fight everything in her path, and she forgot like who she was basically recruiting. This is similar did. to what we see with that young yeah. officer in Andor, right? Who who yep. is so over eager to prove himself yes. that he commits yep. the most basic of errors. 
Same thing. So, or as we would say, in, you know, her assumptions were faulty. Let's put it that way. As anyone who's made a business plan will know, if your assumptions are faulty, the whole thing is built on a house of cards. That's what happened. Yeah. But I did like that reveal, even though I personally saw it coming. I feel like most people wouldn't have seen it coming or yeah. your average viewer wouldn't have. So for me, I yeah. liked that. I thought that was yeah. well, I thought that was reasonably well done, especially yeah, because the last couple episodes or at least four or five episodes, they were teasing everyone to think that Adar was Sauron. Yeah. Right? And. I remember back then, I was like, I don't think he is. I think he's just setting it up for Sauron. And then, of course, that parting shot where we see Halbrand slash Sauron walk into Mordor and see Mount Doom in the background. I think he knew what he was doing. I also think it's a bit ridiculous, though. I mean, and this is, again, for, for story purposes, I understand that. But for practical purposes... Celebrimbor is supposed to be like this master smith. He's supposed to be the best smith known to history in any world, yet he doesn't understand the process of making an alloy. Like, this is the most basic thing ever. Yeah. It's the most simplistic thing of of all things was, like, it's an alloy, like, obviously. And, of course, that is also what the episode was called. That's, like, smithing 101. How do you make steel stronger? Put carbon in there. It's the same thing. What are your steel? What are your swords made of, right? Like, I feel like that should have been his first thing, but fine. Okay. So that's, I'm very happy that we got to see the rings of power actually be made. I was very worried that we weren't going to see the three rings of power. I'm glad we get to see them. I thought that was pretty cool, right? I thought that was really, like, done well. Yeah. And again, once again, you can see where millions of dollars have gone because that forging sequence was stunning. It was absolutely Mm -hmm. gorgeous. From the melting of the, the dagger to the molten ore and the forging, I thought that mm-hmm. was done very well. I mean, they've, they've, I mean, this has been our comment repeatedly, every episode, every week, that it's visually stunning. It's so well done. The costumes, the, the details, the lighting, everything is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. It's just, it's just boring. I mean, I mean if, if it wasn't, I mean, for me, this is a solid mooch. But I have to say, if this wasn't, such a big name on Amazon, I'd, I'd say it's a skip. The, the story itself is not like that compelling for me. I'm, I'm it's just a, along it's a for, relatively for the niche audience, target audience, right? Because it's a yeah. high fantasy epic. Yeah. It's not something that our moms would want to sit down yeah. and watch. But it's, it's like I said, I mean, I, I still think the litmus test for for me is – if I'm with a table of strangers, yeah. I've got nothing in common with them. I can talk about House of Dragon forever, and I feel like we'll have a great conversation. For Rings of Power, like I can still talk about it with them, but I don't feel like there's going to be any like dialogue, dispute, argument, disagreement. You know, there, there's no drama in the show. Okay. The yeah. big reveals came, right? For a while, we didn't really know who the stranger was. It was a genuine mystery. I guess we were all supposed to believe it was either, you know, uh, Sauron or Gandalf, one of the two. Those are kind of the only names that it possibly could have been, maybe. Okay. Now we got the big reveal. Okay. Looking forward to season two. Tell me, what should I be excited about? What what should we be debating? What should we be yeah, thinking Yeah, so about? I think what's going to happen now is the way I'm looking at it is now that we've had some time to let season one finish and marinate a little bit yeah. in our minds, not obviously a lot because yeah. it just ended yesterday. Oh. I think season one, while average mm. at best, I don't want to call it mediocre, but I would say mm. on average at best, it's a solid mooch. I would say what season one did do very well, though, was world building. We got introduced yeah. to Numenor. We got yeah. introduced to the Southlands slash Mordor. We got mm. introduced to, and I can never remember the name, but the Elven City. Mm. We understand the concept of Valinor. We now have what's the progenitors for the MacGuffin, right? So I yeah. think at some point in season two, or maybe season three, we're going, probably season two, we're going to see the creation of the One Ring. Mm-hmm. 
we're definitely going to see the creation of the seven rings for the dwarves and the nine rings for the humans. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to happen. The way I see it right now is we see the dwarven rings be made first, Mm -hmm. then the nine rings for man. I think the dwarven rings will be made first in an effort to kind of persuade the dwarves to ally themselves with the elves. I think the nine will be made. I I don't know why the nine will be made. And then I think we end season two with the one ring being crafted. Just the, the same as we saw the end of season one it with makes the sense. three rings. That's the way I, I see it. And I think what they've done is now we do not need to see the lore as to why who Numenor is and why they're there. We don't need to see the lore of the dwarves. We don't need to see any dwarves. I think season one was really like, okay, here's eight episodes of world building. We're now going to put our foot on the gas and we're really going to accelerate. I think we're going to see the war, not a war. I I don't want to call it the war for the throne, but I think we're going to see some kind of battle for the throne in the Dwarven kingdom. I think we're going to see some kind of battle for the remaining humans uh, in the Southland slash Mordor and what happens to them. We're going to see the the battle with Numenor. And I don't know if it happens in season two, but probably in season three, we see the fall of Numenor. Can I ask a few clarifications? Yeah. When they came back, Muriel and the captain, when they came back to Numenor, yeah. what was happening? What was I supposed to see? Oh. I don't get it. The black sails. The king had died. Okay. Because the city looked exactly the same, but every ship had black sails and black banners. I think it's because that was their way of saying our king has died. Got it. And what was this explosion? I think it's the Palantir. Remember? Because he's talking to another handmaid who he thinks is his daughter. Yeah. And then he tells her about the prophecy, and then she finds the secret room with the Palantir, and then the last thing we see her do is unleash the Palantir. Or by unleash it, I mean uncover it. So what does that mean? So from what I understand, the Palantirs are basically like these crystal orbs that allow you Mm -hmm. to communicate or see. So each Palantir can connect to other Palantirs, like these glass orbs. And so if you've got one and if I've got one, we can kind of communicate with each other. You can see what I can see and I can see what you can see. Okay. So... I think by that's why it's always supposed to be covered. And okay. so I think by uncovering it, I mean, I don't know. This is me fully speculating. I think by uncovering it, she's done something. I don't know what yet. Mm. We'll find out more. Okay. Last question for now. Muriel, the queen, yeah. and Captain Elendil, mm-hmm. is he saying that he loves her? I yeah, get it. I wasn't sure about that either. That <laughs> threw me for a loop. I wasn't 100% sure where he was going with that. Right? That was that sequence where he's teaching yeah. her to walk the number of steps in the yeah. basement of the ship. Right. She's like, who takes care of you? And he's like, everything I always do and all my sacrifices, it's for the kind of for you. Because yeah. I, I felt like, was he saying, like, I've always been in love with you? Yeah. And then they kind of, they kind of hugged, but it wasn't like a it sexy, was, romantic Yeah, it was, hug. they were pussyfooting around it. I wasn't <laughs> sure what they were doing. Uh, I, it's like I, that old sign, it's like that old Seinfeld scene where they meet in the airport, right? Oh, yeah, and exactly. Kramer, and Kramer, Kramer goes to Seinfeld. If if she gives you a kiss, that's a good sign. If she shakes your hand, that's a back, bad sign, right? And then they do she like goes that a half hug, embrace. That half hug thing, exactly. <laughs> and he's like, what does that mean? Yeah. So I, because yeah, he was like, when you asked me why I picked her Galadriel up, he was kind yeah. of implying I did it for you or yeah. something. I, I honestly, no idea. And I'm sure mm-hmm. that'll be expounded upon going forward. So it's done. Eight episodes were done with season one. Well, in season it started two. after after Game of Thrones, and it ended before. And now, yeah, what's Amazon going to do now? I think Eight well, weeks? so they're already filming season two. They've already started yeah. principal production, uh, photography, and videography, or whatever it's called, of the season. I imagine 
Again, in Numenor, we're going to get, you know, we've got the other hand who's basically been plotting against Muriel. So I think we're going to see a little bit of that about man versus man in, in Numenor. And I think that's probably going to set up the downfall for Numenor. Honestly, I don't know. I'm just making wild guesses at this point. I love your wild guesses. Oh, no. So when, do we have to wait another 46, 44 weeks for this? Or is it not going to be like a full calendar year? Or is it going to be more than a full calendar year? What I, think it'll be, I think it'll be around the same time next year. If they've already started shooting now, mm-hmm. I imagine that they'll be shooting for maybe two months. And then I imagine mm-hmm. eight months of, of visual effects, right? I mean, with the money that they've thrown at this thing. You can see, like normally you would expect six months to edit and do the visual effects, or not even six months for a TV series, probably like three months for editing and visual effects at most. I think we're going to see them spend like a good eight, six to eight months doing visual effects. On and, and what's your temperature? I mean, if, if you had to just take the global temperature of, in, of, of reaction... To I think one, it's lukewarm at best. I think it's yeah. lukewarm at best. I think on average, I'll put it this way. I think diehard fans have been relatively disappointed. Oh. And I think that your average fan of high fantasy like you and me has also been de- disappointed, but maybe not as badly. And I think the rest of the world has just been like, it's a very beautiful show, but it's not compelling, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother with it. Anymore. I mean, my my sense is that I feel like there's some redeeming things in here. First of all, as you know, I have not been like a big fan of Lord of the Rings. I haven't even seen all three of them consecutively. I have to say, I'm motivated on my next flight to watch all. Maybe that's probably the wrong size screen to watch them on, but I'm I'm motivated on my next flight. To watch all three Lords of the Rings in order. I have to say, it's it's done that for me. I'm I'm okay with it. That's right. You did even ask me whether yeah. you needed to watch The Hobbits yeah. or not. And I said yeah. that you probably should. Yeah. You'd be safe skipping the entire Hobbit trilogy. But I should not watch The Hobbits before Lord of the Rings, right? If you want to follow it chronologically, you should. Yeah. But if you want okay. to watch it in terms of quality, I wouldn't bother. Will I learn something that would prepare me for Lord of the Rings if I watch Hobbits? No. Oh. I, uh, well, okay, I take that back. Yes, you will. Because you learn about how Bilbo <laughs> oh. gets the ring. All right. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll think about yeah. it. Yeah. Again, yeah. it's the least important aspect of Lord of the Rings is how Frodo yeah. ends up with the ring. It's important that he yeah. has the ring. The Hobbit yeah. explains how he gets the ring. But also, mm. like sixty-five to seventy-five percent of the Hobbit is completely fictional. Mm. Like it's not based on. Sorry, and by that I mean completely fabricated, not fiction. Yeah. As in, it's not a part of the books. It's not a part of the lore. There's a a romance series in there between yeah. an elf and a dwarf that would never have happened. It's it's mm. a bit weird that way. I mean, once again, I mean it's it's a great show to watch. It's just not emotionally or dramatically that compelling to me yeah it's not interesting it's it's the yeah. equivalent i would say of mm-hmm. cotton candy or you know junk food that you get at the carnival fair you're not getting any sustenance out of it you're yeah. you know visually it's very sexy it's very appealing yeah. but beyond that surface level beyond surface level at mm-hmm. the moment not much although i am optimistic that season two will be far superior because they're not going to be bogged down yeah. with describing who yeah. characters are, what they're there yep. for, why they're there, yep. there. I think we're going to be able to just get on with the story. I agree. And sometimes, you know, we can be a little bit spoiled as well. I mean, very rarely have we watched a multi-year series and said, oh, year, you know, the first season was the best. You know, it went really downhill, down, down, down. Usually it's kind of the opposite, that year one is is the first year is kind of when they're getting their footing. Yeah. And then season two, and then it becomes like this global phenomenon, like Stranger Things or whatever, right? Yeah. Then season three is the ultimate, and then they kind of kept it around for another season or two too long, and it kind of like goes down because there's nothing else to talk I, about. That, right? Which is actually, that's a, almost exactly the trajectory of Stranger Things right now, yeah. is that I yeah. think that last season if they had done it up properly would probably have been the last one and called it a day but i think they're doing one more season now 
They're doing one more. I mean, you can't stop it. I mean, there's there's so much money to be yeah, made. Yeah, right? it's I mean, just like, the economics. You're absolutely right. You're, you're do yeah. at this point, it stops being a creative endeavor. It starts becoming a financial investment. Yeah, and when you yeah. start thinking of your show as a financial investment versus a creative endeavor. Things have started to go off the rails, which, frankly yeah. speaking, that's also the baggage that Amazon had to deal with. Yeah, yeah. The, when you're spending seven hundred million dollars on eight episodes, you can't help but think of everything as a financial investment. We need to have. So we've agreed in a past show that we're going to have an episode dedicated to like eighties and nineties movies and and rehash those. We should also have one about like shows. That stuck around too long, you know, and they were like, yeah, the unwanted guest. You know, yeah. we're like, okay, well, I gotta get, gotta get to bed. It's getting late, and the guest is like, yeah, how about one more drink? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guest that just won't leave. I agree. So, look, uh, Lord of the Rings. Sorry, Rings of Power. Rings of Power. Now there's three. Yep. I think the season was a solid, or maybe not a solid, but it was a shaky mooch. I think that if you have Amazon Prime, you should do, and I made this suggestion to a couple of colleagues and friends of mine as well, you would do yourself a disservice to skip it altogether. I think you should at least watch three episodes to kind of get a feel for the visual appeal of the show. Yeah. I would say if you're going to watch it based on the story, Mm -hmm. you can keep it on in the background. I think you'd be fine. I, it's not a show that requires dedicated, you know, with your blackout curtains down and dedicated no. viewing and with your phone on silent. I don't think that's mm-hmm. the show yet. I will no. say I'm optimistic that season two will be far superior. And I hope it is because, you know, I don't want to sit there and be that guy who wishes uh, ill will on anybody. But I just because I, I like the premise or rather the, the IP. So mm-hmm. I want them to do well. And I think they've set themselves up in such a way that now that everyone, all the major players have more or less been introduced, I think we can kind of move on from the fluff and move on to something that's a little bit more substantive. It's important to me as well that the show does well. And, And the reason is that it's fun in life when you have a big epic that everyone talks about. It's, it's good for the fabric of society. It's enjoyable. It's nice to have something that you can talk about with everyone that you come into to contact with, right? That was the hallmark of, you know, Game of Thrones. And I think House of the Dragon is getting there. But Rings of Power, I really want it to be that way. And I, I, it needs to be that common thread that you can talk about with everyone. That's fun. It's enjoyable. I really, really like that. I'd love it to get there, you know, and I, and I think right now there's so much television and some of it is exceptional. I mean, on, on our streamer skip segment, we've, we've talked about so many great shows, but if you look at those shows, how many people, I mean, okay. And, or for example, not everybody is a star Wars fan. Not everybody's watching that, you know, Minx, not everybody industry, not anybody, the bear, not everybody, nine perfect strangers. These are, these are great shows. Night Sky, Blackbird, wonderful, wonderful shows. Not these international, global yeah. phenomenons. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe Stranger Things for the right group, but Stranger Things isn't being watched by our parents. Nearly, I think the number of people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm giving it a mooch. I want people to watch it. I want this show to succeed. And, you know, this is not me as a fan of Amazon one way or another. This is me as a fan of the IP. And also because, you know, you want to see good programs on TV. We do. Keith, my favorite one hour of the week. Wonderful. Apart from the fact, apart from the fact that I get to watch uh, House of the Dragon soon again, is coming to a close. And thanks for getting me up to speed on some of the the finer points that I missed. No, my pleasure. Really good. And of course, you know, this is just my opinion. This is just Ethan's opinion. If you guys saw something that we missed, or if you think that Rings of Power is terrible, or it's good, and you disagree with something that I said, or heck, maybe I misread something in the lore for, you know, leave us a comment. 
tell us what's right. What tell us what's wrong. We're happy to we're happy to correct ourselves and issue a, a retraction. Although we won't publicize it too much. But in any case, <laughs> leave a comment, tweet at us at FNS Podcast, or drop us an email, aloha at filmsandstuffpodcast.com. Reach out, tell us what you like, tell us why Game of Thrones sucks compared to Rings of Power, or vice versa. We're here to listen for it. Indeed we are. Pete, pleasant episode as always. Listeners, thank you for your time, attention, and clicks. We will see you next time on Films and Stuff. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Films and Stuff. If you haven't already, please subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are downloaded. Films and Stuff. There is no substitute.